sheer volume of folks that came to testify for on two different days um, it's very plain that the homeschool community are not in favor of this bill in fact based on some of the testimony and I reviewed the handouts that we were given um, the homeschoolers weren't even consulted when these issues when this issue came forward um, and one of the biggest issues well one of the biggest issues that came forward also was this idea about communication so I find it really odd that, well, on one hand, we, we need more communication, <coughs> but you're not communicating with the group that is going to be affected by these changes. So yeah. what I did, and um, I worked bipartisanship with uh, Representative O'Neill, and we came up with an amendment that basically does two things. Um, first is it adds legislators and senators to the um, Home Education Advisory Council. Um, I was surprised to learn that we don't have a seat here. Um, so we don't know what's going on within the homeschool community. So it calls for two members of the House, uh, and House Ed specifically, and one member from Senate Ed to be on this advisory council. And the other section creates a study committee to look at our homeschool statutes um, and just sit down and dis to really discuss with the stakeholders what's really at issue here. And if we need to bring forward legislation, it would be from that point where everybody's been involved in the discussion. Everybody knows what's at stake, what's trying to be accomplished. Um, and that's simply what it does. Just try to bring everybody to the table to find out what's really at issue here. Would the study committee, excuse me. Are you oh, no, no, that's okay. Uh, would the study committee be similar to the study committee that worked on the special ed? Is that what you have in your the special ed revision. You mean an ad hoc district? committee or no, a set? No, it was a real committee. Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't. It was um, the ones that worked on the special ed. It wasn't. It was a, I can't remember what the word is. It ended up being, it was not a formal committee. And then at the end, it, it was finished when the legislature, which, oh, I can't even talk this morning. The legislative session ended, and then it turned into an ad hoc committee, which is not really a formalized committee. No, this is a formalized committee with um, uh, members that are listed. Um, yeah, well, I made some copies anyway, because I, I knew that there were going to be people that were going to be. Um, and a lot of the folks that are listed here um, are people that are um, uh, from the various organizations that came um, and testify to try and make sure that, again, everyone that um, had something to say about it would have a seat at the table, mm -hmm. um, the various homeschool organizations. Um, and that way, they would be able to talk with their members and um, bring their issues forward. Yep. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Can, can we just take a couple minutes? To sure, read? Yeah. sure. Uh, who's like to read? No, nope, that's okay. Do you need details? Sure. Oh, I thought I'd given you. You did, but I. Okay. Do I understand correctly that the uh, commission would be separate from the advisory council? Yes, yes, two separate um, two separate entities. Um, in fact, the advisory council does have a seat in the subcommittee, in not in the subcommittee, but in the in the committee itself to, to look at everything. <coughs> because you've got school administrators, um, you've got the home. Um, Education Advisory Council, School Boards Association, Homeschool Coalition, the Christian Home Educators Association. 
And these were the major associations that came on, and groups that testified. So um, that way, um, these I envisioned are the major organizations. And, and just to clarify, these two provisions, adding um, legislators to the advisory council and setting up the study commission, mm -hmm. replace the bill and yes. are the entire yes. bill. Yes, because it, it seemed that the um, most of the people that came to testify, uh, again, were very concerned that they weren't consulted, first of all, and that <coughs> they were wondering, uh, you know, why this needed to get done, why, why the change. Um, and that way I felt by having this committee, by looking at what the statute said and getting their input, that perhaps we can come up with a solution that everybody can live with. And that's what I'm hoping um, will come out of it. Because I think being excluded from the discussion, um, I think probably did more harm than anything else. So let's bring everybody to, ta to the table. What are the problems? How can we solve the problems? Take a look at what other states are doing with, uh, with homeschoolers. Uh, we received a lot of information from folks about um, what other states are doing with homeschoolers. Um, how did they handle this type of problem? Is there a way to handle? What do the homeschoolers have to say about this problem? They might have a solution. We don't know because, again, they haven't been brought to the table to even discuss what the problem is. So I just figured that this would be a good way to take a look at the issues, and not just this one particular issue, but to look at all the homeschool statutes and make sure that we're doing the right thing and to make sure that their voices are being heard and their concerns are being met because they might have concerns about other issues that we don't know about because the lines of communication between the legislature and the homeschool community, they really don't exist. So let's bring them to the table, let's bring everybody to the table, find out what the problems are and come up with a workable solution we can all live with. And that's the intent of this legislation. Oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, it should be clear from the questions that I asked during the hearing that I don't believe that we have a problem currently in the state with respect to homeschoolers, and a lot of the um, comments or suggestions that were made are really anticipating that there might be a problem at some point in the future. I would just assume kill the bill, um, but I think that this might provide a compromise and I could live with this. I think that, um, you know, notice, we even heard during the hearing um, of a woman, she happens to live almost in my neighborhood, and she um, notified the superintendent's office, I believe, that she was homeschooling her kids and then the local elementary school, which there's 13 in Nashville, but the local elementary school called and said, you need to register your kids, and there was a lack of communication there and some of those things. But I think that, so even if you set up a process, there may be some problems along the way. I think that um, it would provide a, a compromise. The other thing, too, with respect to the second paragraph and the notification and, and the plan, I'm sorry, the plan, um, there was a question as to who that would apply to. Does it apply only to, to uh, with the development of a plan when they start homeschooling? Would that apply only to families that have never homeschooled before? Or would it apply to a new student who is entering the program? Um, what's the depth of uh, depth required in the plan and those type of things? And I think that there's just a lot of leeway as it's written here. And I would rather. I think all of us as legislators can understand how something that may be intended, even in the best intended legislation, if there's any uh, open-ended issues, if there's not a lot of specificity. Oh, that's a big word. Yeah, for Monday, 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 Monday morning. There's not a lot of specificity here, and I think that it would really do well to study it. So mm -hmm. as much as I think that I don't see a problem, I can live with this study. Other other comments? Go ahead. 
Well, well at, the, at the point that you consider it appropriate, I do have another, an alternate amendment for us to consider that addresses some of the logistical issues that were brought up in the testimony. Um, all right, let's take a look at you. it. <laughs> and, um, Any objection? From no, 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 we're all no, we're here. Okay. Get everything on the table. <laughs> Do you have an amendment, Paul? I do. Um, well, <laughs> you're welcome to have it now. It's, uh, I would certainly <coughs> present the executive session if I wasn't. Uh, there's, a, there's another amendment coming in? Is that well, you, you know, this is Tim, and uh, since I had the work done, I'd certainly like to uh, have it heard at least okay. in the executive okay. session, if not. Okay. Thank you. At this <coughs> session, Paul, or is it makes no difference to me, actually. You guys don't have to deal with it if you don't want to. It's a matter of a vote on uh, Thank you. the exact. Are there enough copies for... I just took whatever they sent me. They usually send 15, I think. No, no. Mm, I only got... They sent three. Oh, oh three? Yeah. Three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there you go. I didn't even look at it, sorry. Okay, you may take it. Okay, so now we've got another review to look at. There's 15, I told you. Somebody else can Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, on the issue of communication, I definitely think that's an important question. I think there were there are two issue, two different areas mm -hmm. of communication that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. One was whether there was good communication around the creation of the bill. I think that the sponsor of the bill felt she was putting something back in place that had been in place for, I think, for the extent of time that homeschooling had was in place until 06. Um, but then there's the other area of communication that the bill was intended to improve, and that was the um, nature of the communication between the homeschooling parent and their local school district about curriculum options and resources, and, and the bill was designed to foster that communication. Um, so, in looking at the amendment um, and considering the testimony that was brought before us um, on the two days that we held hearings, when we certainly had a lot of open communication, um, I, I tried in this amendment to address some of those concerns. Now, the notification prior to commencement of such a program, I'm going to come back to that one because um, there's still an issue about that that I think we can, can fix. Uh, the, the yearly notice is still in place in letter B. Mm -hmm. um, what is removed was the idea of notification on the anniversary date of, um, of implementing the homeschool program because, as people rightly pointed out, it would lead to a logistical nightmare of a whole variety of dates of notification. So that's gone, and it's just by the first day. Um, and in, in uh, Roman 5, People were concerned about the word a draft plan because they thought that there was some opportunity then for maybe for school districts to make changes to that plan. So the word draft was simply dropped so that it becomes a planning document which should imply the flexibility that we all need, the sponsors and the homeschool parents, should be part of um, a homeschool program. So back to the prior to, uh, to commencement. The reason for tightening up the 30-day notification is that there have been instances reported of, of people using the homeschool identification to dodge truancy issues. So if someone is seen not in school and they're identified by a truant officer and the family says, oh, I'm homeschooling, but I just haven't notified yet, that's a loophole that needed to be addressed. But on the other hand, the whole school family said that having to notify prior to commencement made it impossible for them to take a child out in a situation they considered an emergency situation. So I was trying to communicate with DOE about what would be a reasonable time span. And um, just, just this morning, 
you, uh, Roberta, I want to ask you this question. What did you say about how long it takes for a child to be true with you? 20, 20. 20 days. So we thought perhaps this could be amended to say within five working days of commencing such a program. So a parent could take a child out in an emergency, but you could close that through a season. Now, uh, the issue about how often or which parents had to submit a plan, mm -hmm. Roman 5 does say prior to the initial year of a homeschool program, a parent shall provide to the department a plan. <coughs> In my mind, <coughs> that suggests that someone who's already homeschooling would not have to submit the plan. It would be anyone starting a new plan. It seems to me also, I know the question came up about whether, you know, if you're homeschooling one child, do you have to submit a plan for the second child? Um, if that needs to be more carefully spelled out, it certainly could be in this language. Does a homeschool program mean that the parent has a program for all of their children or just one child? You could discuss that and, and address it if you thought that was important. But I, I guess I, I want to come back to the larger issue of why, why keep an amendment that includes a plan. Um, as, as I look through the national agenda for the homeschoolers, it's clear to me that their goal and intention is to remove all regulation. And I'm concerned, although I really, I appreciate Representative Carson's um, proposal that we study the statutes and, and build something together, I am concerned that we might be entering that dialogue with an unstated assumption that no regulation is going to be acceptable. And I think that that's a problem. I, I do believe that asking for some plan and seeing that a parent has the ability to assemble a plan is a reasonable expectation. Um, I think one thing that would be helpful for us in thinking about this is to see what the rules were when planning was part of the um, program, and Ann has copied those mm -hmm. rules for us. And in fact, um, Chris Hamilton also gave us an outline of the, of the rules, and it, you know, it was a list of subjects to be taught, the name of an established co correspondence school if used, the name of an established commercial curriculum provider if used, a table of contents, a list of textbooks. I mean, it's just not an insurmountable hurdle. Okay, so here are the copies of, the full copies of the rules. And, and by the way, new rules are just now coming before jail car mm -hmm. to catch up with the fact that the, no, the uh, curriculum was, the curriculum plan was removed. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a lag there in the way So I guess with that, I, um, you know, I would just open it up to discussion and questions. Did you have No, I'm Any comments? I, I want to take a couple of minutes to look through no, these rules. Um, what I just said about jail car was that there are uh, new rules coming before jail car now, which are in response to the removal of the requirement for a curriculum plan. Roberta, could you could you say more specifically what will be in the, the Home Education Advisory Committee and I worked on a revision of the rules, uh, presented it to the state board, and um, they reflect 406, the change in the legislation from the last time. So, so that's actually what this is. These right. are the proposed new rules. That's yeah. what I said to your yeah. initial proposal. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I misspoke. Okay. So what, but what Chris Hamilton gave us in testimony was what the rules were right. when there was a plan um, requested. Uh, so, so, so she can look at one. 
Ms. Penny, then these reflect the legislative change that was made in 2006. Correct. sitting through almost eight hours of testimony over two days. But this is about children. This is not about the parents. Um, the parents would like to have, in many instances, the same flexibility to teach their children that the public schools have, in that, yes, they have a curriculum, but oftentimes they deviate from this curriculum. And <coughs> the parents would like to be able to do the same thing. They feel that there are things that are being discussed or issues in the public school that are not addressing their children's issues. So that's why they're pulled out of school and they want to homeschool. I wish you could have sat through the testimony like I did and listened to the parents speak very passionately about how important it was for them to be able to teach their children and what they are teaching their children. So I respectfully disagree with you. This is not about the parents. This is about the children. And these parents who believe that they can best teach their children. So, again, I just would respectfully totally disagree with you. Um, again, my issue with bringing this forward is bringing everyone to the table. That didn't happen when the original legislation was passed. Let's hear from the parents. They're the ones that are educating the children in the home. Let's hear what their issues are because we, we heard a lot of things, I mean, after sitting there again, um, that really didn't even relate to the bill, that they had issues that they wanted addressed. And again, that's why I brought this particular piece of, uh, of this amendment forward, is that it brings everybody to the table. Representative Price. Thank you. Um, from my perspective, I continually ask what test scores were. I mean, I look at the, there's a, a I think, a pretty strong um, accountability piece at the tail end, and it's the evaluation process. Um, show me where there is a problem with the students not performing accurately or, or um, sufficiently or up to grade level, or I'm not an educator, so I'm struggling to find those words. I haven't found that there is a problem. Um, 
And I think that um, anecdotally, as you ask parents to take time and do a plan, and I'm not saying it's not a good thing, um, are you taking time away from the children's instruction so that, you know, what is best for the, the children in that respect? And I'm just throwing that out. I have no knowledge one way or another if that's true. I think that if the committee is um, wants to move forward with this amendment that Representative Browse has brought forward, I would like to see a lot more specificity, I'm going to use that word again, <laughs> uh, in here and specifically um, I would rather have us grab the bus and find out that something is written in the rules um, that isn't what we all intended. Who does it apply to? New families, new children? What's the scope of plan? I want it clear that there's no approval needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've heard that uh, there was an individual who testified who said that um, they submitted a few plans and the plans were rejected and this was in the la within the last couple of years when there wasn't even a requirement to have a plan and certainly not even needing a plan. Um, the plan wasn't approved. There is no um, requirement that there needs to be approval. And I'd like to see all that uh, detail. I still believe that um, a, uh, a study is a better option to go from my perspective. May I ask um, the department a question? Great. Yes, uh, my question is, is um, in the testing, where do, where normally do the tests take place? Are they required to be at the school? Uh, if they take the New Hampshire kneecap, then they would be with their regular classmates, who peers in that situation. If they um, take a test of their own choosing, it can be at their home. And who proctors those tests? Um, what has happened is that the parents do. Parents proctor the tests. Correct. I mean, that's the regulation. Is that not true? That's not, true. No. That's not entirely true. But it is it, it's it, it commonly happens, accepted practice. No, 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 really, no, no. Oh, who does? There's no, there's no legislation. There's no legislation that says that it needs to be a proctor. Some states have that, but it be a certified teacher. New Hampshire does not have that. All right, I'm just yes. talking about practice. Practice, okay. Today. But but, in, but the legislation says, doesn't say a certified teacher. Right. Certified so, test teacher. So the legislation requires, there's no legislation on the books that requires any um, proctor. Right. It the doesn't say a certified teacher or proctor. Parents can proctor the test. That's um, not true. But I'm not <laughs> suggesting what practice is. I'm asking what the law is. Right. The, the, it, the law or the rules, say, excuse me, says that, I, I can't remember what the law or the rule says, I think it's the rule says, uh, say that it has to be according to the directions of the of the test manufacturer, the test producer. So if Stanford requires that there be a third person or it be done in a classroom where there be four children who are minimum, then, then that. Or a certified or, test. Or a certified teacher right. or, so it's the test manufacturer that, so according to the rules, I believe. Right. Okay, so. Can I ask a further question about the practice? Okay. I know it's a little bit off subject, but if we're going to talk about results, I need to know. So can, for example, um, an educational s consultant be one of the proctors? Sure. sure. <laughs> a, a, uh, it, as long as they meet the requirements of the individual company that is uh, putting the test out. So Iowa Basic or Stanford Achievement or any one of your nationally accepted standard, standardized tests that a homeschooler may use. Um, usually requires that that test proctor be certified to provide that test. And in most cases in the state today, you'll have um, homeschooling parents getting together and either hiring a proctor to give a group of kids that standardized test um, or providing one of the members of the group to be certified. Um, we've had long discussions about that in order to be able to have integrity in the test and to make sure that there's no conflict of interest in providing a test. Um, for proctor. For proctor. Right? Yeah, but that's been my concern. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've never seen, um, you know, a parent, and I've, I've dealt with hundreds of them, um, ever insist that they not allow the kid to be tested by a proctor that is certified or... But my concern is, is that with the number of homeschoolers that 
and I don't mean to be uh, diminish yes. the, the, the capacity of homeschoolers yeah. and all that, but it's a concern to me as a legislator when I look at the results of the test, yeah. and I know that, for example, the education consultant um, is the is the employee right. of those parents. Yeah. That there isn't to me a kind of a push pull for the kind of um, integrity that I think is necessary when there's an off-site yeah. test given. It's not allowed, I'm not that, sure they do it. It's and allowed. not saying that it's, I have to think of it in terms of policy. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Okay. I'm not sure that's what happens today. Um, but, but it, it, it is, is a concern because there is, that, that, that educational consultant is in fact the employee. Yeah. That's easy to fix, by the way. Exactly. But that's very. This doesn't fix it, but right. that one's easy but to fix. But if we're going to act as if everything that we see in terms of results are in fact as they really are, I, I need to feel more comfortable with the process. Ms. Tim, did you have a comment? I did, and that is that, that is the um, purview of the test giver and the tests that are bought by home education people. So it's not what we have initiated as a state. It's what they have done professionally about their tests. And there's a range of what they accept. Um, and there are groups that you can buy that from that do not specify um, that it should be given by a certified test giver. That's a fact, but maybe not a practice. Representative Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to point out the exchange that we just had, I think is a perfect reason why we should seriously consider my amendment. <coughs> there are a lot of questions here about what's actually going on that we don't know. And by having this committee, we can sit down and we can discuss with the homeschoolers, find out exactly well, what's happening out there in the homes. What do we need to do as a, from a policy point of view to make sure that things are being done correctly? Right now, we don't know. We don't, because we have not been part of the discussion. And that's why I created the study committee to bring everybody to the table, we can sit down, we can discuss this. Granted, I think in, in reference to a comment that uh, Representative Rouse made concerning that there are parents that want no rules, no nothing. Uh, and, and I agree. I think that was very plain from some of the testimony that there are some people out there that just don't want anything. Leave me alone, stay away from me. But I would like to think that the vast majority of people that came to testify to testify were very concerned about what was happening and they want to come to the table and they want to sit down and talk with the state through the Department of Education and with the legislature about what they're doing with their children um, and, and what's happening and what do they see needs to be done. We don't know because we haven't talked to them. So let's create a vehicle where we can sit down and talk with these folks. Um, I'm sorry, no, did I cut I'm, you off? Uh, nope, I'm all set. I'm all set. Thank you. Um, as I take a look at this legislation, there's really two pieces, and one's notice, and the other piece is the plan. And is it everyone's intent here at this, in this subcommittee that the plan would only pertain to new families, families who have never homeschooled before? Is that the intent of everyone here? That's Kim, I see two shaking their head yeah. over there. Kim, yeah. is that your intent too? I'm thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> Because if I look at this, my question, my next question is, how many families begin homeschooling who have never homeschooled before every year? Roberta, do you know? I, I don't know. The 4,599 parents, um, I would assume that probably a quarter or 20% are new to it. Um, but there's maybe may be able to, to tell. It's extremely hard to even guess how many families that translates into. Yeah. <laughs> The state doesn't keep track of it by families. So nobody, because I guess where I'm going with that is that um, I would expect that the number of families would be small. That's just my expectation, and I could be totally wrong. But if that's true, that it's we're intending that it would only apply to new families, um, I don't see the harm in maybe taking a little bit of time to take a comprehensive look at it. Um, that would address the plan piece. If we have a problem with the notice piece, maybe we can, um, you know, make some small amendment on notice and, and then just take a look at, at the rest of it. I just want to throw that out. I mean, what are we really talking about? And is there a problem with taking a little bit of time and looking at it? Mm -hmm. 
just before I call on you, I, I got a little confused. Ms. Tenney, you said there are 4,999 families or students? Students. Oh. 4,599 is what I heard. Oh, okay. 4,600. There are 4,599. Okay. But that's students, not families. 06, 07, correct. Because we don't track families, we track students. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Are these students given um, student identifier numbers? No, they are not, but they, if they do take um, the NECAP or they do take dual enrollment courses, then they do get uh, student identification. So, may I come go ahead, go so ahead. if, say they go to kindergarten in first grade and the parent at that point says, okay, I want to pull my, my child out, I'm not happy with what's going on in the school, that student, the day they showed up for kindergarten, they were given a student ID number. Correct. And that number expires when they're pulled out of the public school system? Well, it's just not used in that period of time. Can I follow? Go ahead. So are they then, if after maybe being homeschooled grades, uh, say one through eighth, they're going into high school now, and the parent decides at that point they want to put them back into the public school system, will that same number pick up? Well, my sense is that it would, but you know student identification numbers are a new process. I would think they would just pick okay. up. Okay, so that would be another point. Uh, to look at. And Mr. Chairman, um, the, the comments that Representative Ross made about the truancy issues, I, I am concerned about that. Um, I, I think that is an issue that needs to be, to be addressed as a loophole. And I think one of the other loopholes, and I think really it was the crux of the legislation, that these kids were being pulled out and they weren't being educated. And they were going back into the public school system and then the school system is having to spend extra resources to get these kids caught up. And I think it's important to bring the homeschoolers to the table because they're immersed in this, this culture of, of homeschooling and they talk with other school, homeschool parents and they might have a solution here other than a mass, because the way I look at this, to me it's after being in the military, it's kind of like a mass punishment kind of thing where maybe two people are doing something wrong so we're going to punish everybody. Let's see if there's a if there's the homeschool folks have a solution. How do you deal with parents that you know have pulled their kids out of school but aren't educating them? Do you what do you do? Is there a solution that you might know of within the homeschool community? Again, we don't know because we haven't talked with them. So may I just dovetail on your question when you would think if any of the homeschoolers would like it, if you don't mind then it's no, 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 no. Um, the question that she just asked, but further than that, um, is there any requirement that somebody who homeschools their child become affiliated or work with any organization that like tries to? Like a support to, group for? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's no requirement, but it's very rare, um, extremely rare that you would find a, a family that would refuse or not want to become part of one of the major homeschool support organizations because there's so much resource there, so much knowledge, so much help but that they get. Yes, thank you. So, but my, I guess that you know because if they don't contact you, right? do you go to the schools and ask how many kids are being homeschooled to try and capture those people yourself? Yeah, well don't forget, um, the school districts are not the only, by law, um, um, permitted participating agent, right? Most of uh, the parents today use non-public schools, the available non-public schools as participating agencies. I shouldn't say most, but a large number. Mm -hmm. um, and Roberta, probably, I don't know if you have it with you, Roberta, but the statistics that show how many families use the local school district, resident school district, as their participating agency versus a non-public school, um, I think we have, um, because we have they the, report number today. We have the agencies that presented, but I do not have that information. That number, okay. So um, the, the, uh, the homeschool um, support groups today, the biggest of which is NHHC and Chen, rep represented on HEAC today, um, Wait, provides, too many what is I'm that? sorry, the New Hampshire <laughs> Homeschooling Coalition and Christian Home Educators in New Hampshire, the two biggest homeschool support groups uh, represented in HEAC today, they offer support to homeschoolers across the board, right? So it doesn't matter who they choose as their participating agency. So, um, and by the, by the grapevine, um, you know um, what parents are and are not um, availing themselves of, of um, uh, 
help from one of the homeschooling organizations. I, for one, because I'm an attorney, get to hear of a lot of situations of parents that do or don't. And by and large, um, you know, in, in the 20 years we've homeschooled my family, I can tell you um, it's a handful of people that, that don't. And the reasons they don't may be because of schedules or whatever the, the reason is, but it's, it's a very small number. Representative Carson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to, to add on to, after sitting through all the testimony, one of the things that struck me was that the communication within the homeschool community itself, almost every parent that got up to speak talked about talking with this one and talking with that one. So I, I think it's an informal network of parents that literally talk to each other. And if there are problems, they pick up the phone and they know who to call. I'm having a problem with this. Well, how do I handle this? What's the best way to teach this? I, I think there's an incredible amount of communication that's going on here. And again, we don't really know about it because we haven't really been involved in the process. So I don't think communication from the homeschool side is the problem. I think there needs to be a bridge between the, the state, and I mean that means the Department of Education and the legislature, with the homeschool parents. So we can sit down and we can listen to what their concerns are and come up with a reasonable solution. Is everyone going to be happy? No. Because again, and that <coughs> refers to Representative Rouse's comments, that there are some folks that are out there that just say, stay away, we don't want you here. But I believe that the vast majority of people are very reasonable. They want to have the opportunity to talk with the legislature about <coughs> things that they believe need to be done. So let's give them the opportunity to do that before we enact anything. Yes, um, let's see, a couple, a couple of things. Um, I think, I think uh, Representative Carson is on the mark when she thinks that, when she says that uh, she believes most homeschool parents would enter this dialogue with good intention because as was said to me, um, it reflects badly on the homeschool program when there are people who abuse the system. So to find ways to solve that for kids' benefit, as yeah. Representative Casey has said, I, I think it's important. I, I think I, as we talk, I see a lot of potential in merging these two amendments so that we could go forward with this plan. The head of the Christian Homeschool Group in New Hampshire said three different times in testimony that this plan was did not represent a burden. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we had ample testimony that of the many issues and problems that came up, this amendment it doesn't address all of those issues and problems. And I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. So I think that it would be very fruitful, very productive for us to go forward with this minimal plan request with more specificity, as Representative Price is suggesting. I don't have any problem with getting very specific language in here. Um, but also putting in place a commission that could review the statutes and consider some of these problems that, that administrators are bringing to us with concerns. Mm -hmm. We do have administrators coming forward and voicing concerns. Representative Price, did you want to speak? Yeah, I, I kind of um, I just wanted to talk here for a minute about what happens with that plan once a plan is done. Because um, the last thing any of us want is to create a lot of busy work that all of a sudden, and, and creating a plan for children's education, I'm not saying it's busy work, but you, you are um, asking people to go through a process that may in fact end up in someone's desk drawer. And um, I think that certainly two of the three of you on that side of the table have been educated before so that you know that as you do an outline, perhaps for a year of study, that the outline becomes filled in as you get closer to the time. And um, I just want to make sure if we're going to go through this that something's going to happen. And maybe that's something that happens is just had in the parents think. The parents who have never homeschooled before are thinking about um, the depth that might be required as they go through the year. But is there going to be a benefit? That's the discussion I'd like to have right here. I just want to make sure there's going to be a benefit. And um, 
that it's not just going to be <coughs> busy work. I'll use that again. I'm interested in, in your, excuse me, are, are yeah. you finished? I didn't mean to yes. interrupt. Uh, the whole idea of busy work. You know what might be helpful as we pursue this whole idea of planning? To take a look at what has been submitted, just one or two, to, to see the kind of specificity, your word, the kind of specificity that homeschoolers have traditionally done on their first time out. Uh, just for my own curiosity, to satisfy my own curiosity, I'd like to see that. Um, and maybe um, DOE could conceivably come up with just an idea of a plan. Uh, is it truly a skeletal plan? Um, which I think, based on my teaching performance was the best thing to start the year with. And as Representative Price said, you fill it in as you get closer to the time when you're going to be doing whatever it is you're going to be doing. Or does it demand much more clarity and crystal balling? Uh, because you're going to be missing <coughs> teaching opportunities if you lock yourself in. Okay, I'm not going to discuss any more educational philosophical views, uh, but I, you know, I, I would just, if, if you could, uh, Ms. Tenney, bring in uh, just one or two, or if, if you have it, email it to us, uh, whichever. Uh, I probably don't have it on email, but right. um, I, I would, could go through the files and I would ask that I work with some people on the advisory council, maybe we could do a couple of representatives, okay. groups, yeah, that, what's been presented. That might be helpful to clarify the idea of the planning uh, aspect of this. Mm -hmm. um, Representative mm -hmm. Ross, you mm -hmm. have something? Well, to just to respond, that I, I see two benefits. One is certainly having the parent go through the exercise of, of developing a plan and gaining awareness of what's involved in making a plan and what the resources are, having to know what the resources are that are available. Um, and the second was, not that there would be approval, but I think the department testified that it would encourage communication with whoever they submit that plan to, who could look at it and say, well, have you considered this resource? Have you considered that Audubon has programs for homeschoolers? Do you know X, Y, do you know about these two organizations that are there with resources to help you? So I, I think that both of those are benefits of Thank you. Um, my question is for Ms. Tenney. Um, when a homeschool parent notifies the department that they're going to be homeschooling a child, do you send them anything, any, like, you know, whatever, you're homeschooling your, pet, your child, here are a list of available resources for you to get in contact with. Do you do that? Um, let me come back to something that you said earlier, and that is that I would welcome the legislative um, uh, communication with the homeschool advisory committee. It will be it would be interesting and I think very informative to have legislative people a part of that. Um, but I, I respectfully disagree about whether or not the department knows what's going on with homeschooling. We have we spend a lot of time. I do. Um, the commissioner Mary Heath has come to the HEAC meetings. It's an important organization in the Department of Education, and we listen listen carefully to what their concerns are. I, I find it a extremely good organization in terms of helping us to understand what will help them. Um, and in terms of what I do when I talk to parents, I often refer them to um, the advisory group, different groups online. And I say you can get a lot of information here, you can get a lot of information there. Um, and we also suggest that they go um, to the district because we really want people to be closest to where they are. Um, uh, where they live, because that way resources are available to them and everybody then can communicate together. Um, we take up, what I spend a lot of my time is, is it, um, brokering, you know, working with people who are having trouble and trying to figure out what that trouble is so that they don't have that trouble. Sort of greasing the, the whole apparatus for them and helping them to be able to cope with problems. Mm -hmm. So, sure, go ahead. So is there a formal line of communication that exists within policy that says how this communication is to take place? Or is it more of an informal type of discussion I, I between the DOE and homeschoolers? 
what I'm saying is, right now, I mean, in, in the, uh, while well, we're looking at a number of amendments, that they can notify either the Department of Education, the principal, the superintendent, non-public schools. The superintendent. So, yeah. so there's a number of people here that, that homeschoolers can talk to when they're going to pull their right. children out of school. Right. But my question, again, and <clears throat> is to looking at the Department of Education right. and saying, okay, we've notified you that we're pulling our child out of school. Right. I don't believe they really need to give you a reason why. They're right. just pulling their child right. out of school. Right and that there's a formal response from the Department of Education. Yes, we understand you're homeschooling your child. Here is a list of available resources to get you started on providing the best education you can for, for your child. And that's giving them the names and the numbers of homeschoolers perhaps in their area, the various organizations, um, just to help them get started. We don't give them the name and address of other homeschoolers in their area because we may not necessarily know that. But okay. we do give them the information about the um, the affinity groups that they have, okay. so they can go online. And there's a there's enormous okay. amounts of information. We in the department have stopped putting that information. We used to have it on a website, um, but you need to keep um, the accuracy of it needs to be really watchdog. And so we agreed through again the homeschool advisory mm -hmm. um, committee that the best way to do it is to have it go um, to the to Chris Hamilton's group, and that group, it's, it's the more up-to-date, active, <coughs> active mm -hmm. website. So okay. we offer that. Okay. Um, is it time for us to look at uh, Representative Ingridson's yeah. Do we need yeah, yeah, we can look Representative Price? Can I Price, say something ahead. while I'm sure. sharing with you? Sure. Mm -hmm. Did here a minute ago? Um, Did you this all get a copy of it? amendment and the legislation doesn't require a discussion. There's no requirement in here for a discussion. All it is is a requirement that a plan be submitted. So if the intent, and I'm trying to get to the intent of everyone here, if the intent is to make sure that the parent fully understands what they're getting into and that the parent is prepared in teaching the child so that the child benefits, um, why don't we just require ask that prior to homeschooling, a parent spend an hour with the uh, superintendent of schools or you know the, the parties that are included here, the, the, the DOE, the resident superintendent or principal of the non-public school, just require that they sit down and go through a discussion. Again, new homeschool only, uh, no approval needed. Um, so that what, what we're trying to get at is that there's some feeling of comfort I'm sorry, I, I missed your I last know. comment. Can you just that if the intent is to have a feeling of comfort that the parent knows what they're getting into and that they're prepared, mm -hmm. just ha just ask for discussion. No approval, again, mm -hmm. no approval needed. Um, all we need families. He's deleting the plan section. I had to read it a couple times. Oh, yeah, is that what that is? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. So section three is the date, effective date. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, I had to look at Because I was going to start yeah. scratching around from my original. Yeah, I don't have my original. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that, he just <laughs> deletes it. Okay, all right. <laughs> someone Go concerning ahead. curriculum and I, I I'm sorry Mike yeah, Capitello Mike Capitello that's I thought that's who you were I wasn't sure sorry. Um, could you talk a little bit about curriculum the yeah curriculum? Um, <clears throat> I um, I can appreciate um, Representative Ross's uh, amendment I, I still would really ask what what is it that we're trying to solve um, mm -hmm. I was part of a, of a state for years in homeschool under that law um, that required very detailed curriculum to be presented at the beginning of the year and revised quarterly and with quarterly reports each quarter um, to the district. And if you think you have problems now, um, you will have an incredible number of problems when those curriculums start to be submitted because I guarantee you, every single district has their own view and will have their own view 
about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, as this committee will, as educators. My wife's a professional educator, my daughter is. And, and they will disagree on what is, is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Further, today, in the law, as should be, we have only the standard of educational progress to really show whether a kid has done good. I mean, I want to see if my kids, um, you know, have made progress in math and reading and writing, and I want to see that they're, they uh, had some progress in being articulate or not. What happens, the tendency that happens, and it happened all over the state, this was New York, um, when parents submitted curriculum is the tendency of the district was always to try and hold the parent to the standard of what was submitted as a curriculum. Did you teach what you said you were going to teach? And the beauty of homeschooling is that you can revise that based upon the kid's learning styles. Like, is he auditory? Is he kinesthetic? Is he vis you know, visual? And begin to mold that as the parent gains you know, experience with the child, and the child gains experience in their learning behaviors and so forth. And what happens inevitably is you create for yourself a new set of problems. One of the biggest complaints that teachers have in this state and every state across the union is that they have to teach to a test. And that is the tendency we go to because it's a convenient mechanism to try and look at a standard. Um, but that is not today the standard of, of how to evaluate whether a kid has made progress or not. So that's, that would be my fear is that you would, no matter how detailed you were, and New York's law was extremely detailed, no matter how detailed you want it to be or clear, you could never be clear enough to handle the number of subjective opinions you will have as to what is and what is not acceptable. And then I would ask, what is the purpose of submitting the curriculum? So that you could see that the parent taught to it? So that you could see that they were prepared? What is it? Um, I, I, would, I would submit to you that evaluation is a far better tool to see how a student is doing than, um, than a planned curriculum, especially for first-time homeschoolers. Ms. Penny. Uh, we're going back. It might have those kinds of problems existed in New Hampshire with the, I mean, we're just going back to where we were, only a compromise to where we are once instead of every time, every year. Right. And we're not anywhere near New York. So no. um, did those problems exist two years ago? Where, where the participating agent was a school district, yes. Huh. Not where they were a non-public school. I didn't, we didn't have a lot of um, feedback that way in the department. Representative Carson had a lot of conflict appointment for this, so she had to leave. I know. Excuse me. There's no point in that. I don't know about that. But um, a, a member of the audience handed me some information. It's being copied now, so um, when Ann brings it back, if we're really ready, we'll. Okay. Um, I think I'm looking for some guidance here. I, I would like for you to be able to vote on anything that we're going to vote on, and I, I don't know quite which way to go, whether to vote first on bringing these two amendments together, um, or to take them each singly. Uh, what, what is your... Um, my, I, I think Representative Rouse brought up some very good points um, with the, the amendment that she brought in. Um, again, my concern is I, I really think we need to sit down with people before we do anything. I understand the, the need to bring in um, a plan to, to, to have that into legislation, but again, I, I think we might be a little premature. We need to sit down and we need to talk with the stakeholders. We need to find out from them, I mean, we heard a lot of testimony um, as to what is the best thing to do. Um, I, I can live with um, prior to the commencements of such a program. I think it's important that they do notify from a legal standpoint that there is some sort of notification to someone that folks are homeschooling their children. Um, and I mean, even with the, the program, we heard testimony that parents said, well, I'll just pull something off the internet and I'll just give it to them and that's going to be the end of it. So. Um, is that the way we want to go? Do we want to encourage that? And I think we have to be very careful with that particular section about what we as a state are going to require.
from homeschooling parents. And that's why, again, I think it's important that we bring them to the table, find out what's the best way to do this, of what can we all live with, um, and try to find some sort of a compromise that will address everyone's needs. Um, and again, I'm, I'm just really a, a big advocate for having a subcommittee putting, and putting the legislators on the committee, so on the advisory council, so we know what's going on. Um, and hopefully we can learn a lot. We, can, um, we, we brought up a lot of questions as legislators here this morning, things that we didn't know about homeschooling. So it would be an educational experience for all of us to, to know how our homeschool children are, are actually being schooled. So that's fine. Uh, I, um, I think I would encourage us to take a vote on merging the two amendments with some added language. Um, actually added language that I mentioned earlier that would not just say prior to commencement, but would say within five uh, business days of commencement to give that would be a way for emergency situations if a parent felt it was mm -hmm. an emergency. It, my concern though is, and, and again it has to do back to, we're not just talking about one particular set of, of statutes, to the truancy law. If a parent, there's a say there's a situation on, on Monday, the parents feel it's an emergency situation. They, they pull their child out. They, t they need to decide whether or not they want to homeschool. They can't afford private school. And they, they contact homeschool, um, the Department of Education, the homeschool associations. How do I do this? Can I do this? You know, and they, they still are keeping the child home. Um, I know it's up to 20 days, but after a few days, when a child isn't in school, the parents start getting phone calls. Um, do we need to take a look at that? Is there, is there a safety net in here that we need to put into place? Um, while a parent, again, if it is an emergency situation, that's going to protect everyone involved with the parent, the child, and the district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. Is, is 10 days reasonable? Ten business days. Ten business. Two weeks, yeah, to give give folks two weeks to decide. Is that reasonable? It's more reasonable. Yeah, I mean, five is. I mean, you don't even even have a week to kind of figure out. That, that's right. pretty short. Right. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Okay. Okay. That's good idea. So, ten days. Is ten days good? Ten business days. Um. <coughs> I'm wondering um, if maybe we need some time to digest what we have spoken here about. And the reason I'm, I'm saying that is we could meet Wednesday at 10, because we don't have sessions for um, no, What about 11? It would, it could you get here by 11? Could you get here? Well, we could recess. We could recess this okay. to date and time certain, Wednesday at 11, this room. Okay. And I will see to, that it gets posted. Okay. And um, maybe we can digest what we need okay. to do before we vote on on. Yeah. Because I see this as a very important piece of whatever it is that we're doing legislation. Right, I, and I agree with you, Mr. Because Chairman. Because it's policy and right. we, we need, need to, to get make it sure. as right as possible. Has the executive session been scheduled on this? It'll It'll be next, week. next week, week. Early tomorrow. Okay. That's our really, that, that's our last possible week for executive. Okay. Um, just, you know, I'm go thinking ahead. about the, sorry. No, go ahead. About the 10 days. I mean, that's two weeks of school. If it really is a cover for a truancy issue, that could be two weeks of missed Instruction. Instruction. So it's uh, yeah. Again, that's that's my argument for the study committee, Madam Chair. That said, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of issues here, and we want to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing, rather than doing something impulsively. So. Okay. Okay. So we'll um, meet on recess Wednesday until Wednesday at eleven. Okay. Thank you. Sounds all great. Very Thank much. you. Thank, thank, thank you for coming. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time and for speaking. Can I ask a question about?
know, off the record and outside of this, just sure. personally. Yeah. I mean, what I'm concerned about is um, it, this looks good in, in, in theory, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering about how this will work in practice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, if everybody walks into the building with a different idea about how much regulation, running the gamut from none to negative none yeah. to some, to too much. You mean how much is okay. needed? Where are we going to, where, what are legislators going to, what kind of action points are legislators going to walk out of the room with? There's never going to be full consensus. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone today on the Home Education Advisory Council that would say, um, I, I'm not sure where Representative got that feeling that, that it's anti-regulation. Well, we're not anti-regulation. What we want to make sure is, is when we make regulations, that they're necessary regulations. Because as you know, um, you know, unnecessary regulations cause other problems way down the road, especially three, five years down the road when you forget what the original legislative intent was. And being part of, of New York where, where parents had to be extremely diligent about the curriculum that they were going to submit. Uh, I mean, really, as a parent, I spent hours and hours on every single kid submitting that and then and then reviewing it every quarter. But that's it, what teachers do too. Right, but it never stopped me especially to showing educational products. All it did was create conflict. You know, it was, and, and cost, because the districts had to now hire somebody that could understand the thing, look at it, evaluate it, contact the parent. But I guess my point is, this just gives the body no power, say, to regulate your say, okay. Right, but my understanding is, is that these kind of commissions and they're sort of an unwritten, Understanding that laws will come out of the dialogue that yeah. occurs, and then I, I, you know, we do actually already have the Home Education Advisory Council. I, I think so, if you added a, a provision, perhaps that um, you know made them responsible to present recommendations to the Education Committee. Um, you know, to, to solve whatever issues came forward that might have a little bit more teeth. But for you guys to actually say, okay, what'd you come up with and why? Um, you know, perhaps, you know, that would help you. Because I'm also concerned about data. Mm -hmm. The data gathering on both ends is, to me, not representative of what I'm going to, I would need to know as a legislator yeah. to be able to make positive Move. Impact. Yeah, move positively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, that's they, a concern. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, there's nothing to prevent us. Um, you know, one thing we talked about with Roberta often was being able to present or, or form out a PIAC, a council that, um, or a subcommittee or whatever you want to call it. Imagine that I don't know a PIAC. Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, where we would actually be able to sit down with superintendents, either one-on-one uh, -on -one or as a group, and, and actually be able to field some of the questions that they had, make recommendations, help them, um, which is what Roberta does on a, on a regular basis anyway. But um, I would love to be able to do that and see, um, because I think um, the, the large majority of superintendents want to do the right thing. There's a couple out there that you know, have predisposed opinions, but you'll always have that in every, you know, every walk of life, right? But by and large, they, they want to do a sincere, good job. And um, I would love for us to hear their individual, and the principal's individual feedback. Um, so I don't, I don't think we, we would hurt for methods of getting that data. Plus, you've got a tremendous amount of, of uh, work out there being done about homeschoolers. Anyway, there's um, uh, organizations like uh, Homeschool Research, uh, headed up by Dr. Brian Ray, who does exhaustive, exhaustive studies that are already paid for um, on homeschoolers and the demographics and, and things like that you can also map against. There, all I'm saying is there's some mechanisms that we could deploy uh, to get some good you know, real good feedback of what's going on in the state. After listening to you, I, <clears throat> I'm wondering if we are going at this backwards. Rather than structuring a plan, structure an evaluation system. Yeah, that's, what I was well, yeah. <laughs> that's part of it. I mean, that, 
Yeah, and that's why it really should be studied. What is the problem? No one knows. I mean, we've recessed this hearing, but we're still talking. Yeah, we're still talking. But <laughs> no one knows what the problem is. And if you have an issue with notice, I can agree that change some of the notice laws, you know, change that now, and take a look at what you have going and where you actually need to change something. It's been two years that there hasn't been a plan. Why are we all of a sudden rushing that we need to change it? We're not even sure what needs to be done. And so that I think that if you do it in a thoughtful way, you may come out with something that may be beneficial to the students. The other side of that coin is why did we change it in the first place? It didn't seem I wasn't here. Yeah. It's been done. You can't go back and say no, no, but I'm just why. saying it, you know, it's, I don't know why. But it's been done. So now, if you want to go back, no. that's why 500 people said that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. But if nobody ever Thank looks at the plan, hmm? but if nobody ever looks at the plan or approves it or anything, that's the way why the you bill should said, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. That's why you should take a look and see what yeah. really. What is it that you're trying to accomplish and sketch and, and right. develop something that meets I'm, your goals? Exactly. I mean, I would much rather see some kind of an evaluation at the end to see how the homeschoolers compare on a general thing. But if, it's, if it is being used as a cover for child abuse, it's too late. Oh, yeah. No, no. So you've got to get in on the front end and the back. It's probably more what prevents a four-year-old from getting abused then? I, I, this isn't it's preventing uh, abuse, but it's allowing it. Uh, and, uh, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Yeah. No, it isn't. Well, then that happens, oh, that happens to four-year-olds. You work in this area. It has been used as a cover of child abuse. <laughs> it's really very and, and but we have child abuse laws. Well, I mean, you're going to have to give those children our I can put my hands in the United States school, 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 school labor, and the whole system evaporates. The child labor laws are ignored. The abuse laws are ignored. Amongst only that little tiny percentage, which is not you, by the way, but it's those people who are now being enabled uh, to abuse their children. And those children are not here. So we, why, don't, why don't we then pass regulation on three year olds? But those children would be abused whether they were attending school or not. Homeschooling, however, is a very effective cover. But it's no more effective than uh, I'm, I'm saying that the minimal regulation we had before uh, got eliminated in 2006, and I've seen evidence of child labor laws being ignored with homeschooling as a cover. I think it's wrong. Yeah. Well, just yeah. average every year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's in the church. Well, that's what I asked for this.